Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the 175th anniversary of Iowa's statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinars on the second and fourth Thursdays will continue throughout the year. You can learn more about the series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about immigration and migration to Iowa in the 19th and 20th centuries, and learn more about a few immigrants through their personal stories. We continue the conversation about migration to Iowa during our next presentation when we address Iowa's Black migration. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are now available by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Jeff Brummer. Jeff is an Associate Professor of History and the co-coordinator of the Social Studies Education Program at Iowa State University. He specializes in early American Republic with an interest in the history of the American Midwest. In 2019, Jeff was a Fulbright Scholar at the Northeast Normal University in China, one of the most important American studies programs in the People's Republic of China, where he taught US history and the history of capitalism. He is currently writing a, writing a new book about the history of Iowa, which will be published in late 2022. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Jeff to begin the webinar. Hi, thank you, Jennifer. And welcome to everyone for taking part in both this webinar and the others that have preceded it and will follow. Essentially, this is um, like a crash course on Iowa history. And today, of course, we're looking at uh, immigration to the state. This is a big topic and most subjects will be covered without too much detail. I'm glad to answer questions afterwards or to suggest ideas for future exploration. Much of this lecture will cover material familiar to most of you who are listening. The immigration of a variety of people from European countries, such as Norway, Sweden, or Holland. Iowa's population has become much more diverse since the 1970s but a surprising variety of people came to the state before 1930. The first great wave of migration to Iowa came before the Civil War, so before 1861. And it lasted from 1833, when the state officially opened to American settlement, to about 1860 or 1861. Of course, there were several thousand native people living in the state, especially the Sauk and Meskwaki. And there had been some Europeans and some American settlers here before 1833, especially fur traders and fur trappers. By 1845, native people have been forced to give up their lands in Iowa. In 1846, Iowa officially became a state. And the next 15 years before the Civil War, more than a half million people came to Iowa from elsewhere. Some Meskwaki returned in the 1850s to Tamar. Most of these early immigrants came from northern states, such as Ohio, New York, or Illinois. But thousands of foreign-born people came to Iowa as well. They included Dutch, Swedes, Norwegians, Germans, and Irish, as well as the Amish and those who settled in the Amana colonies. Thousands came to Iowa from elsewhere in the United States, 
mostly northern states, in many years. <clears throat> but the story will focus on the foreign born and immigrants. Between the Civil War and the Great Depression, from the 1860s to the 1930s, a greater variety of peoples migrated to Iowa. African Americans came to the state in larger numbers after the war, the Civil War. Many haven't escaped slavery. Eastern Europeans, such as Italians and Russian Jews, moved to Iowa as well. Since the 1970s, when refugees first came to Iowa from Southeast Asia, the state has seen a growing diversity of migrants from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And you can see these three main time periods in front of you on the PowerPoints before the Civil War, Civil War, the Great Depression, and since the 1970s. Immigrants came to Iowa seeking economic independence. A Wapello County history noted that older states such as New York and Pennsylvania were quote, good to immigrate from, unquote. They were good to leave. Migrants came to Iowa because they wanted affordable farmland so they could feed themselves and following generations. People moved to achieve what they could not in more populated areas or more expensive areas. James Crawford wrote to his father in Vermont in the 1830s, extolling the virtues of Iowa. He said, I can raise all the provisions we shall want for one half the labor you can on your best land. Sarah Welch Nossaman and her family left North Carolina in 1831, living in Indiana and Illinois before moving to Iowa territory in 1835. They eventually settled in Jefferson County. Sarah married at age 17 and moved farther west in 1843 with her husband and children to live south of Pella. They lived in a shanty of poles and bark, chasing snakes and skunks out of their primitive shelter. People migrated for a number of reasons, and you can see this in front of you. These are what's known as push and pull factors, things that brought people to a location or things that pushed migrants away from home. So people came to Iowa for a variety of reasons. Push factors were those that forced people to leave their homes, such as unemployment, hunger, or political or religious repression. Poll factors drew migrants to a new area, such as job prospects or positive reports from earlier migrants. The drive for economic improvement motivated most migrants to Iowa. The Irish came to the United States to escape the potato famine and British rule. Norwegians came to Iowa because there was little good farmland in their country. Mexicans came here to escape a civil war, their civil war in the 1910s or to work on the railroad. People from Sudan or Somalia or Bosnia came to the United States to escape conflict in their countries as well. One of the first groups we're gonna talk about is one you're probably familiar with, Swedish. A group of Swedes established the appropriately named New Sweden in Jefferson County in 1845. They left their homes because of high taxes and the lack of economic opportunity. Positive reports about political and economic liberty brought many to Iowa in the 19th century. <clears throat> Some founded the town that became known as Madrid, south of Boone. New Sweden had about 500 people by the Civil War. Other Swedes left their homes as well, living in Madrid or elsewhere. Mary Stevenson and her husband came to Iowa in the 1860s. She wrote to her parents in Sweden, that quote, our new home has many advantages over the old one, and I like it much better, end quote. Mary asked her parents to consider moving to Iowa to join them, as life would be better in the United States. The areas on that map 
uh, that were colored, excuse me, were the ones most likely to have Swedish immigrants. The darker the color, the more Swedes. Okay, sorry about that. Next slide is on Dutch immigration. Dutch immigrants also came to Iowa, settling in Marion County in 1847. Their new colony was called Pella, named for a place where Christians sought refuge after the Roman Empire almost destroyed, uh, should be destroyed Jerusalem. <clears throat> These immigrants left the Netherlands because of agricultural failures, religious persecution, and high taxes. Five or 600 settled in Southern Iowa in 1847. Dominique Hendrik Peter Schulte, leader of the immigrants, had purchased 47,000 acres with a group of associates from the colony. They wanted to live in an area Dutch farmers had recognized and where they could grow wheat and raise cattle. Schulte also wanted the settlement to be established near navigable rivers where farmers could export surplus production and also purchase necessities that they did not make themselves. By 1860, the Dutch population in Iowa was more than 2,600 people. Dutch migrants moved to Northwestern Iowa after the Civil War too. Land around Pella became too expensive, which eliminated opportunities for new farmers. The cost per acre in some places became as much as $60. In the summer of 1870, more than 300 migrated to Sioux County to homestead. Many lived in sod homes, working incessantly to improve their houses and land. Within five years, the Dutch population in the county exceeded 2,500. Other immigrants from Norway, Sweden, Germany, and England also came to Northwest Iowa. In one township in Cherokee County, almost one half of the farmers came from Sweden. Another township in the county had several hundred German families. The Irish were one of the largest immigrant groups to the state. And as we all probably know, one of the largest immigrant groups to the United States. They've been coming to work as miners in Dubuque since the 1830s. Many Irish came to Iowa in the 1850s, fleeing their homeland after the failure of the staple crop potatoes. William and Robert Mann came to Iowa. They were happy with the country as its climate, soil, and government were preferable to Ireland. Iowa was, quote, the best place for a free man that I've ever seen, end quote. Some Irish lived in urban areas, such as Keokuk or Des Moines. Others farmed near Pella or around Cedar Rapids. Irish laborers also worked on railroads. Significant numbers also lived around Des Moines, Fort Dodge, Iowa City, and Cedar Rapids. 1895, the Irish residents of Iowa totaled more than 33,000. An example of these immigrants was John Mulroney who lived a quite varied and adventurous life, who eventually ended up in Northwest Iowa. Mulroney had been born in Ireland in 1832, and he migrated to New York City at the age of 13. He worked at a blacksmith shop in New York before taking up farming in Connecticut. He then moved to Wisconsin and sold lumber out of a flatboat. California Gold Rush then lured him west, and he worked as a miner and ran a store until 1857. Then he moved to Palo Alto County in Iowa, where he was an early settler. Mulroney operated a cattle ranch in the county for eight years. He moved again to Fort Dodge, where he ran a mercantile business and did contracting work on the Mason City and Fort Dodge Railroad. Next group we're going to talk about is also one of the largest immigrant groups to Iowa as well as the United States. 
And these are Germans. Germans first reached the state in the 1830s. Davenport became a destination for many Germans who had left home to avoid required military service. Or they left home because of failed revolts against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In Davenport, migrants established musical societies, debating clubs, and other German organizations. You see an example of one woman here, Louisa Sophia Gellhorn Bolin. She moved with her family to Ackley in 1868. She was amazed at all the work that her mother completed from knitting and baking to cooking. Quote, nearly always with a baby at her breast, Sophia recalled. German immigrants enthusiastically supported the Union during the Civil War. And some were among the first to enlist once the war broke out. In 1895, there were more than 132,000 uh, people in Iowa who'd been born in Germany, making them the largest foreign-born population at that time. Okay, next group we're gonna look at is something you're familiar with. The Amish were some of the first white settlers who came to Washington and Johnson counties in the 1840s. They were a highly religious and distinctive community who lived a pastoral life isolated from outside influences. Most avoided the use of modern farm machinery. The old order Amish of Iowa stressed plain clothing and agriculture, living in compact communities where they could enjoy religious freedom. Their homes had plain furniture and homemade rugs. They refused military service and any oath of loyalty. The Amish had a high level of mutual assistance and stressed frugality and self-sufficiency. They usually farmed 100 acres or less, rotating corn, oats, and hay. Most used horses for field work, even in the 20th century and applied animal manure to their fields rather than artificial fertilizers. A German communal society migrated to Iowa in the 1850s, settling west of Iowa City in a collection of villages that became known as the Amana colonies. They began in Germany as a community of true inspiration, a religious group that focused on simple gatherings and churches. They brought 26,000 acres of land in Iowa and wanted their new settlement to be self-sufficient and isolated from outside influences. It was named Amana, a biblical name that meant believe faithfully or remain true. The first 33 members arrived in July, 1855 and began to clear land and construct homes. <clears throat> Immigrants built six villages by the end of 1864, the community had more than 1,200 members. People in Amana lived communal lives where they shared resources and cared for each other. Community members worked at whatever they were best qualified to do by training and experience. Some members were farmers who labored on the land, tended livestock, or produced wine from vineyards. Others were bakers, teachers, or carpenters. Many men and women labored in a mono industrial enterprises, producing furniture or wool. In exchange for their work, the community fed, clothed, and provided housing for its members. But whatever its members produced became common property of everyone. The Amana villages embraced modern technologies, adapting electricity and telephones, as well as cars and trucks. Much of daily life was arranged and regulated with community elders prohibiting card playing and bicycles in the late 19th century. Okay, next group we're gonna look at are the Norwegians, another large significant group who came to the state. You see here in this picture, a sod house. This picture is not from Iowa, it's from South Dakota, but it gets across the challenges and the primitive life you might find in Northwest Iowa, late 19th century. 
Norwegians were the first Scandinavians to come to Iowa in large numbers. Most came for economic opportunity, leaving a country where only three or 4% of the land could be cultivated. They lived in Story City, Oak Ader, Huxley, and Decorah. Ole Nielsen, who lived in Asterville, wrote, quote, from the land, you can get anything you need, unquote. In Norway, there were only barren hills and no vegetation, he wrote. In 1895, the state had 27,428 people who had been born in Norway. Luther College was established in Decorah in 1862 to train clergymen. Classes in 1860s and 1870s were usually taught in Norwegian. Students were mostly Lutherans from the Midwest. The next slide is on Italians, a group you might not think of having come to Iowa, at least in large numbers in the 19th century. Several thousand Italians also came to Iowa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, fleeing prolonged economic difficulties at home. Most settled in Des Moines or in the coal fields of central Iowa. You see a picture of a coal miner here. They also owned stores, hotels, or saloons. Other Italian immigrants opened up grocery stores or barbershops. Iowa's coal mines attracted single men from Italy. Earlier immigrants often sponsored new arrivals who then brought other family. Boys went to work in the coal mines at age 14 or 15. Italian immigrant families lived in small shacks and the winter wells froze. Women grew gardens and raised chickens or pigs by caring for their kids. They often took in boarders to help earn extra income. Some Italian men became foremen or even owned their own mines. Life was better in America, even though everyone had to work very hard, wrote Iowa historian Dorothy Schweder about the coal mining districts. Iowa's Jewish population was small, probably always less than one half of 1% of Iowa's population. Keokuk had the state's largest Jewish population in the mid 19th century. Iowa's first congregation was organized in the city in 1855. Its population of Jews was larger than that of Chicago before the Civil War. Yonker Brothers was a Jewish firm that started in the town before the Civil War and expanded into a chain of department stores. Another congregation began in Davenport in 1861. This community procured a Torah skull and holiday prayer books from New York. Small clusters of Jews were scattered across the state. Many worked as merchants or peddlers. Some peddlers saved enough money to open their own business. One immigrant who you see here on the right hand side was named Moses Bloom. He settled in Iowa City in 1857 and opened a clothing store. He was elected mayor of Iowa City in the 1870s. More than 500 Jews lived in Iowa at the time of the Civil War. 37 men served in Iowa, Iowa regiments during the conflict. The first synagogue was built in Keokuk in 1877. In late 19th century and early 20th century, thousands of Jewish immigrants came to Iowa, fleeing persecution in Russia. By 1918, 16,000 Jews lived in Iowa. Iowa's African-American population grew during and after the Civil War and in the late 19th century. Keokuk, which shows up repeatedly here, had 245 Black residents in 1860. They had their own church and a thriving school. At least 112 African-Americans lived in Muscatine, working as farmers, blacksmiths, barbers, cooks, and servants. Only about 1,000 African-Americans lived in the state in 1860. One of these was Moses Mosley, who you see on the screen. 
He escaped from slavery in Missouri about 1864 and came to live in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. He wrote that the transition from slavery to freedom was beyond description. He noted that free slaves were glad to take it in the rough and would quote, make the best of it we can by improvement. In 1862, Matilda and James Boosie escaped from their owner in Kentucky, riding in his wagon and fled north to the Union Army. They took nine children who lived with them. A 10th, their son Tom, could not be rescued from a nearby plantation. The family reached Davenport in 1864. Five years later, their son Tom found them in Iowa. Thousands of others also fled Southern states to take refuge in Iowa, hoping to lead a better life. About 10,000 African Americans lived in Iowa by 1900. Most of the black men who lived in Iowa during the Civil War volunteered to fight in Iowa's Civil War African American Regiment. The picture there is not of them, that's of a Kansas regiment, but it gives you some idea of their obvious pride uh, in wearing the uniform of the United States. Number of African Americans in Iowa doubled to about 20,000 by 1920. They lived in river towns like Dubuque and in cities like Waterloo and Des Moines. Most had to work in low paying jobs with men working as porters or janitors. Black women labored as maids and cooks. African-American men also worked in meatpacking plants in Sioux City or at a John Deere factory in Waterloo. Iowa was not a racial paradise, but it was much better than Southern states. Samuel Hill, you see his picture in his book here, which you can find online, 47 Years of Slavery. Samuel Hill, <coughs> excuse me, escaped from slavery in Tennessee and eventually settled in Iowa. Paul had been born in North Carolina in 1818. He had been enslaved in North Carolina, but was sold away from his family, losing his wife, Margaret, and five children. He was taken to Tennessee, where he was enslaved for almost a decade. He remarried had nine more children. During the Civil War, Hall provided intelligence on Confederates to nearby Northern troops. He, fed, he fled his plantation with his family a few days after he heard about the Emancipation Proclamation. He returned to Wallace's plantation where he'd been enslaved with Northern troops. He freed his family, excuse me. Samuel Hall then had his former master load a wagon with foodstuffs as well as his wife and children. They escaped slavery he, at the age, his age of 47, and they moved north to Washington, Iowa. Hall bought a farm and sent his children to local schools with his white neighbors. He lived for almost 50 years as a free man. One immigrant group that began to move to Iowa in increasing numbers in the 1910s and 1920s was drawn by employment opportunities and pushed out of their homeland by a civil war. These were newcomers from Mexico. The census only counted 29 Mexicans in Iowa in 1900. They came to work in the state uh, on farms and railroads, fleeing the bloodshed of the Mexican revolution and limited economic opportunities. Workers were also needed during World War I. David Macias left Zacatez, Mexico, and came to live in Bettendorf in 1914. His brother Manuel followed, as did other Mexican workers. By 1920, Iowa had more than 2,500 Mexican inhabitants. Mexican immigrants lived in different difficult circumstances and usually worked the toughest jobs. The United States Department of Labor often restricted them to agricultural employment and did not let them become citizens. Men worked as farm laborers, completed railroad maintenance, or toiled in meatpacking plants or brick factories. 
David Macias came to work for a factory in Bettendorf. He ended up losing his left arm in a near fatal accident. Mexican families lived in shacks, cottages, and railroad boxcars in the neighborhoods of Holy City in Bettendorf and Cook's Point in Davenport. The neighborhood known as Holy City grew up in Bettendorf. Ernest Rodriguez and his sister Patricia were born in a boxcar converted into housing. Bathing was done in the river. Toilets consisted of community outhouses. There was no electricity or running water. Coal for stoves was often taken from freight trains. The first homes in Cook's Point were built around 1916. By 1927, about 100 people lived there. This number increased to about 270 by 1949. A community faucet provided water. Residents chipped ice from it in the winter. There were no paved streets or sidewalks. Women usually worked in the informal economy, limited by racial and gender discrimination to domestic labor. They supplemented family income by taking in borders or by doing laundry or sewing. Mexican women also raised chickens, grew gardens, and sold eggs for extra income. Farm work paid little. Unlike earlier waves of immigrants, few Mexican families could accumulate capital to buy their own land. They lived in some of the worst and most challenging circumstances in the state. Despite being denied opportunity and equality for decades, scores and scores of men from Cook's Point and Holy City fought for the United States during World War II. Now on to an amazing story you probably don't know about. A boy in Syria named Salom Risk had his mother die, then his grandmother, and he was left what he called himself a ragged, half-starved orphan. He had no shoes and no kin in a war-torn country. He learned from a teacher he was an American citizen because his mother had been one. Resk spent five years trying to get documents to prove his citizenship. In 1927, he made it to Sioux City, where he stayed with his brother and labored in a meatpacking plant as a peddler and as a dishwasher. He began fourth grade at the age of 20. He had advanced to ninth grade in the semester. Later, he opened up a shoe store. By the mid-1930s, he was giving lectures about his immigrant experiences in Iowa. Reader's Digest magazine hired him to give lectures in American schools in the 1940s, and he eventually gave talks before one million American school children. While emphasizing the virtues of his new home, he warned that racial arrogance, national pride, and militarism could endanger the United States. There's also uh, about 40 years after Risk got here, a new generation of immigrants came to the United States. After the Vietnam War, 13,000 refugees came from Southeast Asia to relocate in Iowa. The most well-known of these refugee groups was the Thai Dong, the first of whom came to Iowa in 19, late 1975. They fled communist China in the 1950s from Vietnam. They then left Vietnam for Laos. They finally sought shelter in Thailand. Iowa Governor Robert Ray welcomed them and thousands of other refugees. About 1,300 of the Thai Dung resettled in Iowa, mostly living in the Des Moines area. Despite an aversion to harsh winters, they were glad to live in the state because our community could remain together. Many worked in meatpacking plants. Some started businesses, including a contract sewing business that operated out of a storefront. In the late 1970s, hundreds of thousands of people fled Vietnam. Known as the boat people, their plight gained worldwide attention. Ray welcomed these new refugees too. The state established a refugee service center to assist newcomers 
and Iowans donated more than a half million dollars to provide food. Among the refugees were Thais, Laotians, Hmong, and Vietnamese. One man, 31-year-old Tran Van Kiet, spoke English well, having worked in, in South Vietnam at an army base. Kiet was offered two industrial jobs within a week of his arrival in Iowa. When Robert Ray left office in 1983, he visited Iowa's Refugee Service Center. He met with some of the resettled refugees. One of them gave him a gift and told him, we are giving you this present because if it weren't for you, we would not be alive. In the 1980s and 1990s, immigrants from Latin America or the American Southwest came to Iowa to work for meatpacking plants. Meatpackers could not hire enough Americans to work in their plants. So they recruited immigrants, often undocumented as employees. Businesses claimed they did not knowingly hire undocumented laborers. The jobs were grueling. Workers stood in the same spot eight hours or longer, cutting carcasses at a fast pace in near freezing temperatures. In Mexico, unskilled farm laborers might only make as little as $4 a day, so even difficult work paid much better than Mexico. Packers also hired other Latin American immigrants, as well as those from countries such as Laos or Ethiopia. The influx of newcomers added a diverse mix of new people from around the globe to Iowa. This provided many challenges to the state's towns, but reinvigorated declining rural areas whose native population had been leaving for decades. Some immigrants encountered some hostility and suspicion from those that did not think they assimilated quickly enough or learned English quickly enough. But immigration transformed Iowa towns. An example of this is Storm Lake, which was dramatically altered by the arrival of a steady stream of immigrants from Mexico that started in 1982. By 2017, less than half of the town's population was white and students spoke 30 languages in local schools. Uh, Marshalltown, Des Moines, other cities, there are dozens and dozens of dozens of different languages spoken in our schools. The newcomers strained the local public school system, which had to provide costly English as a second language instruction. Schools added scores of teacher aides to help those who didn't know English. Racial tensions sometimes led to fights, but schools fielded integrated soccer teams that attracted passionate fans. Residents came to realize that their future was a shared one. Uninsured employees taxed a local hospital with unpaid hospital costs. But Storm Lake did not have empty storefronts. Some immigrants started businesses, including restaurants and grocery stores, which offered a kaleidoscope of produce from around the world. They also spent their money in town, bought homes, attended church, and went to the local community college at night to learn English. People came to Iowa for economic opportunities like previous waves of Germans, Swedes, or Norwegians. Silvino Morales came to Storm Lake after his business was looted and damaged during the 1992 unrest in Los Angeles. He owned Valentina's Meat Market. His wife worked at the pork plant as well as at their business. He rarely had time off, but they owned a 22 acre farm where they raised lambs and goats. Refugees from Southeast Asia also lived in Storm Lake, including Abel Sang Champagne, who came to the town at age 16. His family had fled Laos and he was born in a refugee camp in Thailand. He worked with his parents at the Tyson Pork Plant after he graduated from high school. I was so blessed to get him to Tyson, he told a New York Times reporter. He became an American citizen, worked his way to be foreman of the plant, supervising 300 other employees. 
By 2017, he owned a home and two cars. The American dream was elusive for those who could not remain in Iowa, though. And there on the screen in front of you, you see a little bit of an article from the Storm Lake Times about a Mexican boy who is deported. Julio Barroso, an eight-year-old boy, and his parents, Antonio and Luisa, were deported from the United States in 1996. Julio was featured in the front page of the Storm Lake Times a month before that. He returned illegally to work in Storm Lake at an egg facility at the age of 17, having learned English in his eight months in a student in the second grade. He became a supervisor at the factory. After four years in Iowa, he left to visit family in Mexico. He was not allowed to return and barred from legally returning to the United States for 10 years. Barroso lived in Guadalajara, married and had children. He earned $100 for working 72 hours a week as a truck driver, sometimes robbed by street gangs. Barroso wished to return to Storm Lake, which he remembered fondly. As a boy, he had wanted to be a teacher. He said, Mexico is very beautiful, but there is a lot of injustice. He is still waiting to return to the United States. One last individual in our story here is Ophelia Valdez. She was more fortunate than Julio. She now lives in Iowa with her husband and son. She came to Storm Lake at age 15 from Durango, Mexico, following an aunt who worked at a meatpacking plant. She did not know much English, but she thrived at the local high school, earning a 3.98 GPA. After her aunt left to return home, she raised two cousins and worked three jobs. In college, she worked 70 hours a week to pay for her education and earned a business degree in 2008 from Baina Vista University. She found a job in human resources at a farm supply company, married, and had a baby. Her undocumented status put her at risk of deportation, but she finally received permanent residency. She'll probably be an American citizen soon, one in a long line of immigrants from around the world who, store, who have contributed to the state. Next slide. Iowa has taken in immigrants and refugees from around the world for centuries. Immigrants don't just mostly come from Western or Northern Europe anymore. These are some of the places people come to Iowa from now. Iraq, China, Bosnia, Mexico, Sudan, Somalia, and Ethiopia. And to summarize, immigrants came to Iowa in three great waves. The first was before the Civil War, dominated by Europeans from places like Germany, Ireland, Norway, and Holland. The second wave of immigration, roughly from the 1860s to the 1930s, was more ethnically and religiously diverse with thousands of African-Americans, Italians, and Jews from countries like Russia. Since the 1970s, immigrants to the state have come from around the world and around the United States with a diverse new mix of people from Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Everyone has come to improve their lives, to find a greater economic opportunity, religious freedom, or to escape from hunger or repression. The United States and Iowa is in large part the product of this immigration. And Thank you, lastly, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, of course. Join us again on February 25th at noon for Iowa's Black Migration into, around, out of, and back again. Thank all of you. I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And thanks for the uh, shout out for our next program we have coming up here with Ricky King. Uh, so we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. 
However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind our participants uh, that you can submit your questions through the Q&A feature right there on the screen. We are in a schedule though, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. And our first question is, we'll start kind of a basic one and opening up here, but why do you think people from so many different diverse groups wanted to come to Iowa? Well, um, Iowa, it was, once the native people in Iowa had been removed, there was a, a heck of a lot of space. Land was sold pretty cheaply. And Iowa, as we all know, has got some of the best land in the world. And the United States was an agricultural country. Most, uh, well, all of the 19th century and a big chunk of the 20th century. So people came here to start farms. They came here to work on railroads. They came here to join other family members. They followed people uh, like the Dutch who had come before them or Swedes or Norwegians. People came because they thought they could achieve their dreams here. This is a question from Annalisa. Uh, typically Northern European, with the exception of Italians, um, are portrayed as coming of their own accord seeking opportunity and land while later immigrants, uh, such as Italian, Black, Latin Americans, were recruited for hard and undesirable work like coal mining and meat packing. How does this affect their acceptance and view as opportunity growers versus burdens on the system? Okay, I didn't catch the, the last part of what you said there, forgive me. Yeah, so essentially the question boils down to how does this affect uh, what type of work they came here for and what they're doing, their acceptance and view as opportunity growers versus burdens on the system? Well, that's an interesting question that ties into many of the political debates we have today. Uh, if you came in the late 19th century or early 20th century, you, you weren't a burden to the country because there was hardly any social welfare net at all before the New Deal. Um, and even today, there is, they're very limited, uh, especially if you're not a citizen, in terms of assistance you can get from the government. So everyone that came was kind of expected to make their own way. Today, we have assistance uh, through the Refugee Center uh, for people who want to be resettled. Uh, but generally, pretty much throughout American history, those who have, have come are kind of expected to uh, take care of themselves, pay your own way. Many people came and they followed family members. A lot of the immigration was a result of people riding back home saying, hey, maybe riding to someone in Southern Italy. Hey, we can get you a job in the coal mines south of Des Moines. Maybe it was uh, someone writing to relatives back in Norway or Sweden saying, like the one woman who wrote to her parents saying, come here. So uh, what social assistance there was, was often provided by families, communities, or churches. So, um, but opportunity for people who weren't seen as fully white, like maybe Italians or Eastern Europeans who weren't accepted by um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, or those who were African Americans or, or Mexicans, um, American society put limitations on what they could do based upon the color of their skin. Um, anyway, I'll, 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 that that's an answer which could take books. So yeah. I'll. Uh, I'll avoid rambling all day and let you ask another question. Uh, so one question that came in, um, so there was a time, so why wasn't there as much immigration from about 1930s to 70s? Ah, that's an excellent question. This is something I cut for reasons of time. So thank you for asking the question. Mm -hmm. In the 1920s, there was a series of restrictive laws that the federal government passed. These are the, uh, uh, immigration laws of 1924, 25, and 26, and they set limits on who could come to the United States. And these limits were based upon census numbers from decades before. So the Immigration Restriction Acts basically brought an end to immigration, what immigration there was from Asia, uh, highly limited, if any, immigration from uh, Latin America, it also tried to keep out people from Eastern Europe as well. Um, the United States um, has blossomed and bloomed and benefited tremendously 
since the 1960s. There was a um, new 1965 Immigration Act, which uh, removed the restrictions from the 1920s. Uh, and that's why immigration has blossomed. And the benefits of immigration are many. First of all, more consumers, more producers, more workers. 40% of the people that founded um, the top 500 companies in this country, the S&P 500, 40% of those people were immigrants or the children of immigrants. So, uh, the benefits of this country from immigration are generally huge. I, I, this is a question I like, and we'll, we can look at it through a historical lens, uh, but do you think Iowa Nice plays a part in our acceptance of immigrants? Well, recently, this whole country has seen a little bit of a, a breakdown of, of American Nice, but here in Iowa, we have been extremely welcoming. Uh, especially if you look at the 1970s uh, and at those who came from Southeast Asia or those that have come in the recent decades from uh, Africa or elsewhere. Um, I, that, that's a politically loaded topic. I, I tend to think most people are good. Most people are welcoming. They, we welcome our neighbors and we care about the people around us. I come from California and we've always... Uh, we've been quite happy at Iowa Nice, and I think any Im immigrant would be too. We can, let's end on this question, um, and it's a great one for research. I know you do a lot of research over the years. Do you have any favorite primary source that you've discovered or anything that jumped out in your research that you really love? Uh, yes, I noted a couple here. One of those was um, Samuel Hall's 47 Years of Slave. That was in one of the PowerPoints here today. And you can find that online. Uh, that is one of the only uh, memoirs of, of African-Americans that came to Iowa and had been a slave that I can find. That is, it's, it's written with the help of uh, a pastor that he knew. So if you read through it, uh, part of it is in Samuel Hill's voice, part is in the voice of his, of his friend who's helping him write it. So if you look at it and you read carefully, you can get Samuel Hill's point of view. You will also will see uh, the influence of the man who helped him write it. That, that is one of my favorite primary sources as well. Uh, Glenda Riley, who uh, is a fantastic historian of uh, the American women in the American Midwest, edited a series of primary documents published in Iowa's journal, The Annals of Iowa. So if you find that journal, you type in her name, you'll be able to find some of those uh, edited female diaries as well. Th those are some of my favorites. If anyone wants a copy of the presentation I just gave, uh, I'd be glad to provide it, send me an email. Uh, there's about 30 footnotes with all sorts of information, you can track information down. And, and thank you for that. Uh, and this also will be recorded and put on the Iowa Culture YouTube page as well uh, for later watching. Uh, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. I think we can all agree it's been an informative lunch. I said it every time we do a webinar and I always learn a lot every time. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinar on the 25th. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for our future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaclosure.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other uh, fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings from our Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here right again on February 25th. Thank you.